I did musical theater for five years in Mumbai. You go in for a sound check, you have six months of rehearsals, and you're trained by vocal coaches, you're trained in choreography. At one point in time, I could actually do a half split. Can't do, it, can't do anything close to it now. But yeah, it was amazing. And I didn't realize it at the time, but I was learning so much of lighting when I was on those sets, when I would see the lighting techs adjust everything, when I would see them. The very way I direct my talent now is based off how I was directed during theater. That is photographer Shazad bin Wandawala. On this episode, we get into that age-old story of an artist who decided to do one thing, in Shazad's case, musical theater, but as the stories often go, he had to find a new path. For Shazad, photography was there ever since he was a kid, but his story of finding a new path, where it took him and the work he's doing now is really fascinating, and the work he's doing is incredible. So please check out the show notes for his website so you can see his work, and also check out our YouTube page for a more detailed video walkthrough of his portfolio where we talk with Shazad a bit more about the specific work he's done and the stories behind it. But first, here's our conversation with Shazad Bidwandawala. We're going to talk a lot about photography. We're going to talk about how your origin story of photography started because photography is such a difficult profession at this point. <laughs> and we say that difficult in the last 20 years of digital being the mainstay. This photography can be very difficult. And, and there's a lot of talk of, you know, it's easier, it's simpler. All you need is an iPhone, blah, 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 blah. But you are somebody who started off in photography in a way that some of us old heads are obnoxiously angry about in that you did not shoot film, you did not have a dark room, and I'm not going to poo-poo on that <laughs> for you. But how did you start into photography and get to the point where you're at today? So the first time I picked up a camera, I was two years old. <laughs> that was my dad's old Kodak film camera. That was like the first time I picked it up and I was like, oh my God, I love this. <laughs> that little thing continued on through my childhood. But eventually, school and all of that and, and photography just disappeared altogether. The first time I took an actual photo was probably on a family trip back in 2006, 2007, maybe. And so I was like, really, not that long ago, in the no, big scheme of things. No, not at all. And I was like, well, I like this. It's cool when we're out in a new place. Mm -hmm. There's stuff to see. There's stuff you want to photograph to remember. So... That's how I started photographing things. I started picking up the camera whenever we were on family vacations. And eventually I got my first DSLR on my 18th birthday. My parents were like, okay, what would you like to get? And I said, it would be nice to have something cool. And they were like, okay, but we're not going to give you something stupid. So mm -hmm. think of something that is actually useful. So yeah. I was like, well, maybe camera this time. So I got the Canon 600D. And I was like, oh my God, this camera is awesome. And it was, it was my mainstay camera for about four and a half years, five years. Oh, wow. Um, and I think that is like the film camera of the digital generation. Sure. Because you start off with the APS-C sensor mm -hmm. and you see all these amazing photos that you want to try and create. You crank up that ISO to 400 and boom, there's noise all over the image. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um, and you it's figure... It's the brownie of the digital cameras. <laughs> <laughs> and you figure that, well, there is something I'm missing. Yeah. That sends you down the rabbit hole on YouTube where you want to try and figure out what that M stands for mm. on the camera dial. You watch like 10 videos, you pick up the camera thinking, okay, I know everything I need to know. You'd make the adjustments, you click it, and there's a silhouette of your subject if you're lucky. Right. <laughs> right. My garbage is now really in focus. <laughs> I have a yeah. really nice raw image of garbage. Fabulous. No, not raw image. It's a JPEG because you still don't know what raw images are. Right, right. So, it takes up too much space on the card. I yeah. Mean, why are we doing that? It's so much space. The colors don't look as nice. And, <laughs> and you see, okay, I look at the JPEG. That looks like it has nice color. Yes. That raw yeah. What is this? Why doesn't this look nice as soon as I've taken the photo? Yeah. Hey, it's um, funny. You, you look at, you know, if we're talking about dates and dating ourselves, it's like I remember first renting a digital camera and the CF cards and SD cards were, they were outrageously expensive. So you wouldn't even, you'd have to rent a card 
when you rented a camera. Yeah. So I was like, well, I can't shoot raw. I can only shoot this much. And you go back now and I'm like, man, that would have been great to have in raw. And now you're like, <laughs> a card? I, I define cards between the car seat. I mean, they're probably laying on the ground somewhere. <laughs> That's true. Technically, my first digital camera was a Lumix point and shoot. I think it was a G something sure. at the time. Yeah. And it was really cool. It could super zoom until the moon was would fill your <laughs> frame. And I was like, this is awesome. <laughs> but... Again, being born in like the 90s and digital was not affordable for a very long time right. until the last few years. Sure. For me, seeing a camera for the first time, it was an Olympus film camera. Mm -hmm. I had no clue how to develop it because it was still that part where having a dark room was like, okay, do I need so much space in my house to go into yeah. a dark room if I'm not doing this professionally? Sure. And developing services were still quite a few back home in Mumbai. Mm -hmm. So you had the option of just taking the film roll and giving it to get it developed. And yeah, you get still, it, I still get very it. cheap in the States at that time. It was like, you know, get away with $10 and get yeah, everything Yeah, and you done. get it back a week later and you see that, okay, yeah. everything looks like trash. Uh, so, <laughs> so you at least had that option. And eventually... Growing up with technology, you'd say, okay, this is taking so much time. I'd rather have a digital thing. And then the point and shoot digital was better than a point and shoot film for me at that yeah. point in time. So I never really got to exploring a manual film camera. And then eventually it just became that, okay, digital makes sense for me yeah. to And that's to pursue. not uncommon. I mean, you know, a lot of photographers will poo-poo, oh, well, you didn't have the experience in film. You didn't have the darkroom experience. I'm guilty of it as well. I worked in a dark room, so I immediately know more than you. But, you know, your background, before we even get into the technical side, or actually pushing the technical side uh, away a little bit, you know now, and most people know, that there is a storytelling yeah. component to photography. Yeah. And any art form. Yeah. Where did that begin for you? So that began for me, I've had a love for storytelling forever. Growing up, I was on stage all the time. I think my first touch with storytelling would be elocution competitions. You'd learn like this piece and you'd go and deliver it in front of people and you'd need to imbibe what you're saying so that it became like you were the storyteller telling a story to an audience. Oh, wow. So it was like this cross between drama and elocution and it got me into like this whole thing of voice modulating and all of the things that I learned over the years combined to create the photographer I am today. And storytelling in its purest form was something that my mom imbibed in, in me and my younger brother. She'd read us stories when we were kids and she'd bring the characters to life by creating voices for each of the characters oh, in the wow. story. And every night the story would end on a cliffhanger. Um, <laughs> and, and the condition would be like, okay, you get to hear the next part of the story if you fall asleep in the next 15 minutes. <laughs> so we'd be like, okay, but we're going to sleep. We're going to sleep. <laughs> I'm going to sleep so hard tonight. I promise. Well, was stage something you were interested early on in? Was that where you wanted to go career-wise? Yeah, I did musical theater for five years in Mumbai. Okay. And I know I asked did... you this before, but I want you to explain that to yes. me. Because again, you know, on the lowest common denominator, you were from India. The mm -hmm. most thing we say, well, what kind of Bollywood did yes. you do? And I know yes. that's not the answer, so, but explain that to us. So I was in the lead cast for Grease and Sound of Music. Oh, wow. And in Sound of Music, I played Rolf, the guy who does the uh, You Are 16 Going On 17 mm -hmm. song. And for Grease, I was one of the T-Birds with the lead character. Okay. Were you uh, Kiki? No, I was... Who was the Italian... Um, okay, yeah, character. yeah. That, actually, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. You do have that, you know, from the movie, you do fit with that. You know, you got dark hair. There you yeah. go. Dark hair, you know, olive oil skin. You can play Italian, <laughs> Armenian, whatever, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, God, I'm going to blank. Somebody, some musical theater nerd will know. But yes. Yeah, understood. so that was my exposure to musical theater. And I did that for about five, six years. Oh, wow. Yeah. And it was amazing. We did over 100 shows of Sound of Music. We did over... Holy cow, that's a lot. Jeez. Yeah, we did over... I think we crossed the 50 show mark for Greece, and it was a ton of fun. Now, uh, was this professional or was this... It some, was professional. Oh, wow. So 
yeah, we we were playing to audiences of 300 to 500 people. Oh my gosh! Um, so this is serious. Yeah, this yeah, is yeah. not just weekend warrior. No, no, no. This community was, theater. This was okay. uh, full time work. You go in for a sound check. You have six oh. months of rehearsals, wow. and you're trained by vocal coaches. You're trained in choreography. At one point in time, I could actually do a half split. Can't do it. Can't do anything <laughs> close to it now. But yeah, it was amazing. And I didn't realize it at the time, but I was learning so much of lighting when I was sure. on those sets, when I would see the lighting techs adjust everything, when mm-hmm. I would see them. The very way I direct my talent now is based off how I was directed during theater. I would say, okay, I need you to be in an open position or I need you to come in from, like sometimes it still slips out. Like, okay, let's have you come in from stage left now. Sorry, camera left. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Well, but that makes sense. I mean, if you are used to being lit yourself and understanding, you know, if I turn myself this way, I can actually feel the light on me. Yeah. Therefore, I need to explain that to my subject. So the one thing I always tell my models now is, Make sure that you can feel the light shine in your eyes, because if you don't feel the light in your eyes, the audience cannot see your eyes. Mm. That's something that it's drilled into your head on stage. Sure. That it's okay if you cannot see the audience. It's okay if you're going blind from the lights. The audience needs to see your face. They need to see your expressions. And the only way to do that is to have the light in your face. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Now, I have to ask the horrible question. What happened? How come you're not on TV? How come you're not in movies? What happened? There was a lift that went wrong and at one point in time. And I could not do a couple of the dances and stuff oh. like that. And eventually, it also came down to, is this a sustainable career? Sure. And it wasn't really sustainable. Because I tried auditioning for a couple of Bollywood productions and stuff like that. And that didn't work out too well because mm. my Hindi is considerably accented for what it needs to ah, be. Oh, okay. And, and they were just like, yeah, well, that accent doesn't really work. <laughs> <laughs> we're not, yeah, yeah, I, that, yeah. I, uh, you know, in any language, there's always like, I can hear where you're from and we <laughs> yeah. don't want that. <laughs> yeah. That's so, not what we're going for here. So that was something that I would always consciously try to push against having a more neutral, a neutral, neutral, accent. A neutral accent. Okay. Yeah. Okay. My brother, on the other hand, is an actor and oh, wow. a singer and he does perform for TV shows and advertisements and he's done films as well and He is on that path Mm -hmm. and he was able to overcome like the whole accent barrier. Um, (laughs) I was not able to. Well, um, that's okay. You're doing your own thing now, which is is fabulous. It works out great. We both started with theater and we both started on stage doing the same things. And we both are trained singers as well. He decided to pursue that. And I just got into the whole visual aspect of things. Were your parents Um, involved in performing? No. (laughs) No. Um, so how my did parents, two my, performers come out of your family? Nobody knows. Um, <laughs> I'd say my dad used to do a little bit of like, not really acting, but he had like the flair for it. Okay. My he mom, was a character. Yeah. Um, <laughs> my mom has always loved characters. Okay. Like her storytelling and all of that. If she had tried it, she would have been very successful mm. at it. Like we both know that. Okay. So it definitely comes from both of them. It's just that they never pursued it but they made sure that we did that's great because that's yes. you know pushing no, pushing not, your kids that neither way is... of neither of us would be where we are today if we didn't have the support of our whole family we stay in a joint family and so there's my dad my mom my brother and me my dad's mom my dad's siblings his brother and sister we all stay together and they all raised us as a unit we always joke that yeah we've had two fathers two mothers and a grandmother um <laughs> so So, yeah, it's a collective thing that's all come together to push us in the direction that we both went in. I did go the corporate route. Okay. Um, That's what I was going to ask. Did you go, you didn't go straight into? No. Straight into photography? No. So after theater, I did a postgraduate diploma in human resource management. I worked. The most creative um, and exciting world you can possibly go into. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) No, there was a reason for doing that. I thought if I could connect with an audience on stage, 
I can connect with people in the corporate world. And that okay. was the closest okay. that I thought would be a segue from the world of theater into the corporate world where I would still be interacting with people. I would still be working with people and just connecting with people. But things don't always play out like they play out in your head. Um, <laughs> and it's still HR. It's yeah, still not the it's most still exciting. HR. It's still not very exciting. But I learned a ton out of it. Everything I've done, there are things that I can pick and choose from everything I have experienced and I bring it into photography. Ah. How to deal with people, how to know when a model is going to be flaky on you, mm. how to know whether a project is going to pan out on the basis of how someone is reacting to your discussions. Mm -hmm. All of those things are things you look at when you're interviewing someone and seeing whether you're going to hire them or not. Ah, okay, very All smart. All those skills carry forward into photography. It, it carry forwards into the business side of photography. Right. And that's also a very important component when you're doing it full time because... Right, because we'll break down what you're doing now because, I mean, there is... You're doing a lot of studio work. Yeah. Which is the heavy duty business side of photography. It's yeah. almost like the creative side is second, third, or even fourth on the list sometimes when it, it comes is. to studio work. It is. It all started with action figures and it's now people. So <laughs> that again, you're, I want you to explain that to me because I, not only has digital taken over, I mean, we all have phones in our pocket and Instagram and things where everybody can poo poo all this stuff. However, this is really a beautiful training and breeding ground for some really great creativity. Yeah. And this concept of toy photography is a relatively new genre of photography in my it is. mind. And you're going to have to explain it to me because it, it's one that it, we all did it. We all played with our G.I. Joes and different figures and took pictures of it, but then it became a thing. Yeah. Then it became a, a beautiful, hardcore, competitive genre to be in yeah how did this how did you come about it when i got that first dslr the other thing is when i figured that well apart from photographing action figures i also need to photograph people mm -hmm. i was like well i don't want to have to pose people so let me go to a concert and photograph musicians okay and with my brother being a musician it was easier to sort of get into the groove of photographing musicians and having been on stage i knew like which would be like a good spot to pick to get like the right angles and, and not get mic mouth the, yeah, the yeah, first mistake exactly. we all make when we go yeah. to a concert yeah it was an easy segue for me to do that and i photographed a bunch of artists and it was very cool but then i didn't like the whole user agreement side of it mm -hmm. where you get paid nothing yeah and as soon as the image is sent to the artist it goes on to all of their posters and because if your work is good it's going to go on their promotional posters but you don't see a cent out of it so, and I didn't have like a business mindset on what kind of agreements are supposed to be signed beforehand, what kind of releases are supposed to be granted or uh, withheld or anything like that. So there was a lot of money that was on the table that I saw, but I couldn't touch. Mm -hmm. And I figured, well, this is not feasible for me from a long-term perspective. Anything with the music industry very quickly turns into you're not making any money. Yeah, unless you're a performer and you've got a good backing. Yeah. So we'll come back to Iron Maiden later. I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but action figures. Action figures. Action figures or toys. How's the best way to describe it? I'd say both work fine. Okay. But if you have someone who's really into it, it's an they're going to get riled up and say okay. it's an action figure. Got it. Okay. And you cannot call it a doll for sure. No, 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 no. I'm never, no, no, no. no. I, I am a longtime GI Joe fan, <laughs> but I have a three year old now, so there's a part of me that. I have a three-year-old and I was a big time collector in baseball cards and sports memorabilia. And so I know there's a collectible, there's a tradable item. Yeah. Um, but and just because your Batman figure has a Batman in a soft goods suit does not make it a Batman doll. It's still a Batman it's, action it's figure. It's an action figure. <laughs> so talk to me about how you got into this world of action figures. And we're talking more about the larger posable right. yeah. kind of like, you know, names like Sideshow and McFarlane, mm -hmm. the bigger, heavier duty, very well-made and sculpted artistic yeah, pieces. Totally. So when I got that first DSLR, the 600D, after a point when I started doing my postgraduate diploma, 
I needed a creative outlet because mm-hmm. studying for that was soul sucking for me because <laughs> it was back to like my BCom degree. I have my bachelor's was in commerce and accounting. So it was back to all of that. And I needed a creative outlet because I'd been doing musical theater for five years and suddenly it was back to academia and I needed a creative outlet. Mm-hmm. So I picked up my camera, I pointed at, at random things in the city, but that didn't really hold my interest for too long. I found a box of old action figures, which were just in storage from when my brother and I were kids. There was a Hulk where we wanted to show him have bullet impact. So we'd taken a softball pin and we'd made (laughs) holes all over um, the chest, simulate bullet impact. I mean, we may do it. (laughs) Sure, as we all have. Yeah, We may do it what we had. And I posed these action figures and I pointed the camera at them and I said, wow, this is awesome. I started learning how to pose them. I bought two table lamps, a sheet of white card paper, and I put the action figure on there, turned on the lights, flicked the picture. It was terrible. It was so bad. <laughs> it was it was so bad. Um, this is the world's worst catalog ever. <laughs> it was. And then I went ahead. I started YouTubing. I started learning about lighting. I learned about shutter speed. I learned about ISO. I learned about aperture. I started experimenting with those things and I had a trusty 1855 the one APS-C, the kid, the kit lens. The kit lens yeah. because I said, well, it's a lens. It can do yeah. everything, right? It so, zooms. I'm done. What, what do I need? Yeah, it zooms. That's why they made it. It zooms. <laughs> <laughs> and I figured, yeah, why not? So I was with that lens for the longest time. I had those convertible Power Rangers figures. Okay. I had a couple of other things. I just put them together on this white background and a black background afterwards. And I started photographing these action figures. I had a few Lego minifigures as well. So I started photographing those as well. Everything just looked terrible. But I knew that there was something in there that spoke to me. I've been a nerd all my life. I'm very proud of it now. So I've read, I've read more comics and forgotten more comics than most people would have read um, (laughs) over a span of many, many years. (laughs) So all of that really spoke to me. Being able to have Hulk punch an action, a stormtrooper and being able to photograph that. There was something so exciting about that. There was something so exciting about being able to pull the head off a Lego minifigure and stick it on Darth Vader's lightsaber and be like, oh, this is an R-rated Star Wars right here. I think this would be the better story anyway. I'm going to make it. So there's so many things as a fan and as a part of a fandom that you come up in your head, but you never get to see it on screen and you never get to see it sometimes even in the comics. Mm -hmm. But with action figures, it lets you be the storyteller. Mm. It lets you create stories that never existed except in your head. So that stuff really spoke to me. And I started posing action figures. I didn't care that the photos were terrible. Okay. I was like, it's fine. I'm getting to play with action figures again. <laughs> I went and bought a few new ones as well on the pretext of photographing them. Well, of course. I mean, uh, you need the tools. It, yeah. They're my subjects, right? Exactly. <laughs> and I was miserable enough during that postgraduate diploma that my parents were like, it's fine. It's like a way for him to just get some creativity going. There's a lot of worse outlets out there. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So it started off as just a release. Eventually, once I got that first image where the lighting just clicked and I was experimenting a little bit with Photoshop as well. Mm. And I put together a composite of the earth there's Darth Vader in the background and you have these X-Wings flying towards the Death Star and you have TIE Fighters coming out from there. (laughs) And I could create all of this and I could see it. I was like, this is amazing. (laughs) Um, So that's how I started off with storytelling in these images. I started this in 2015. I got my first opportunity to photograph for a company, I think in 2000... 17. So it was about two years of just nose to the grindstone. Mm -hmm. Eventually, I let social interactions (laughs) slide because I was like, well, this is more exciting than Mm -hmm. going out for a party or something like that. 
how quickly did it evolve into when we see into an obsession? <laughs> well, I, I, no, it's your job now, so it's not an obsession. It's a no. Career. At the time, it was just something just like a release. Obsession. Yeah, okay. it was just an obsession. I was like, okay, this is cool. I want to do this. How quickly did you start getting into that that fully realized imagery? Because we look at action figure now, and we'll you know we, we're going to do a, a video version of this where we go over some of your work. These action figure photos are fully realized maybe four or five months i think really yeah before i was fully invested and i knew that i needed to keep learning mm -hmm. keep advancing keep just getting better i think it was four or five months in and i knew that this That's is it. this is it this is going to be my creative outlet from now onwards i experimented with a lot of compositing i experimented with lighting i experimented with a ton of different things at the time nothing looked good my first real encouragement was when I qualified for the Tamron photo challenge. I became one of, I think about 20 or 30 people from West India to qualify into the finals. So at that point in time, the Tamron photo challenge was you'd have submissions come in from all over India and then they'd pick uh, winners from the West, South, East and North. And I think there was a central as well, I don't know. And then they just combine all of that and then there would be a final that would happen. So I qualified from West India and I went to this meet and greet with the jury panel uh, where all the other selections were there as well. And mine was the only action figure work on there. Really? At yeah. that point? That at, was the only one? At that point in time, I was the only one. Really? Um, okay. In fact, when I did it professionally, I think I was one of the first... I'd say maybe in the first five, maybe even the, at the most the first 10 professional toy photographers in India. So that seems, that seems crazy with as many people as that are there. Exactly. And then of course, the, the photography, I mean, exactly. is big. I don't remember seeing anybody working for companies at the rate that I was working with them when I was. So I was having a good first mover advantage okay. from a business perspective. But going back to that Tamron thing. So... I went on stage because they'd call you up, they'd turn up your images, you had to talk about them, and then they'd sort of give you a critique on them. Mm -hmm. And they were like, well, it's cool, but it's shit, <laughs> <laughs> essentially. Yeah, there's only polite ways they can say that. Yeah, and I was like, what are you saying? This is amazing. <laughs> because I'd recently learned how to use strobes, and uh, okay. everything was strobe lit, and okay. there was stuff that... It was shot outdoors as well. and Which is complicated. A yeah. very complicated skill to learn. It looked cool mm -hmm. from where I had come from. Because in my head, I was like, eight months back, it was on a white backdrop with a table lamp. Mm. And this is where it's at now. So sure. this is really cool. Um, <laughs> but I wasn't thinking that this is shit in the larger yeah. um, perspective <laughs> of things. Uh, so that was definitely eye-opening. And they were like, don't be disheartened. There's a lot of potential. Oh, that's great to hear. But this is not it. Mm. You know, um, <laughs> this is not it. it. It's a long way to go. And okay. this is just not it. And I got similar reviews when I'd shown my work to other people as well in the industry and just other photographers. Mm -hmm. And some were dismissive that, oh, it's just action figures. Mm -hmm. Some were, they'd just look at it objectively as a photograph and give me critique. Mm -hmm. I learned more from those than people just dismissing it as sure. action figures. But it helped. It helped. I took the critique. Mm. I said, okay, this is what's not working and this is what is working. All of them said that we love how engaging it looks. So I asked one of them, well, what do you mean by engaging? He said, well, there's some kind of a story going on here. We like that. Okay. So I said, well, that's, that's a strength. I should tell more stories. I should tell more things where people get to be involved in what is going on, even if they are just a viewer. Mm -hmm. So I figured that was a strength. And they said, the lighting could be better. I got a few tips from people saying that, okay, this is how you can improve on it. The Instagram community at the time, I reached out to people. I reached out to these guys who had been doing it for a while before me out here in the States. And they said, well, this is cool. Why don't you try doing this? And why don't you try doing that? And I made a lot of good friends that way. It was amazing until it blew up and then you had like <laughs> half the world doing it. Right. And then with stuff like that, the community tends to deteriorate yeah, over time as well. Get, starts to dilute. Yeah. And it gets a little backstabby and stuff yeah, like sure. that. So for a while, 
it was a utopia for nerds. <laughs> <laughs> then came people thinking, oh, we can get free action figures if we photograph it and mm -hmm. if we publicize it and stuff like that. Yeah. And things got a little murky yeah, after a sure. while. But all in all, it was amazing. I got to work with some of the most amazing companies across the world. I got action figures sent. At its height, I had about 330 action figures. <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> but that was amazing because, in fact, even the customs official figured out that, okay, if it's this package, it's going to this guy's house. <laughs> um, so I, I, I eventually had a fellow in the customs office who was like, yeah, this is that photographer guy's uh, stuff that's come in. And, uh, hey, we got some more toys for you. Come pick it up. <laughs> so... In India, customs is a lot more stricter than it is out here. So okay. we had to have letters from the company saying that, no, this is a promotional item. It's uh, not been bought. Oh, um, uh, okay. Okay. So I got a duty exemption through that and stuff like that. Wow, so, so you were really learning a whole lot of yeah. business stuff long before you were wanting to learn business stuff. Yeah. It was just a matter of this has to be done. Mm -hmm. Because the first time I got it, I, I had to pay about 110 or 150 dollars of duty oh, um, <laughs> because because I did not have the correct paperwork when I saw that I asked the official I said well what has to be done and he said well to avoid duty you need to make sure that you get all the paperwork in mm. order send us the paperwork and that way we know that it's not something you've bought but it's something that's just been sent to you as a promotional item interesting so interesting a lot of business, a lot of understanding how to pitch to companies, all of that came from action figures. Like a lot of the pitching that I do today has its roots in how I used to pitch my work to a company I would really want to work with. Sometimes I'd get the companies come to me to work with me, mm -hmm. but sometimes I would have to approach a company because sure. you're one guy. It's not necessary that they're going to see your tag because a hundred other people are tagging them <laughs> right. as well. So you send them the email, you do the spade work, you pursue it across avenues of that contact us field. Mm -hmm. You find who the art directors are, you find who are the people in the company, and you send cold call emails. Out of every 20 you send, you might get back a response from three or four, mm -hmm. sometimes none. Yeah. So that really prepared me for what I face today as well. So indirectly, it it was like a training day for me, <laughs> um, like an extended training day sure. that spanned five years, but it was amazing. So with the success of the action figure idea mm -hmm. and getting into creating theater in the small, when did you make the choice to become a student again? When the corporate world did not seem like something I saw myself lasting out in for much longer. I had to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. And it was confusing at the time because theater hadn't worked out. The corporate world wasn't working out. Photography was great, but what then? Right. That's a, that's a tough. Yeah. yeah. You're yeah. not making a living at it per se, or is it, it's becoming a fun hobby? Yeah. Okay. I was getting the action figures, but the kind of precedent that was set was that you weren't really paid. Your payment was the action figure because okay. each one of these pieces would be anything from 90 to 350 $400 a piece. Okay. So... Not terrible, but still not... Yeah. Um, you know, better than exposure bucks, but not necessarily paying your bucks, rent but in, in that. Even then, even if you look at an action figure of 450 you were expected to send in at least 12 to 15 images. That's quite a bit. Yeah. So That's several days, if not a week or, of that's work. That's several days of work. Yeah. And 400 for several days of work, it doesn't quite add up. Yeah. Even if you wait six months until the price goes up on that figure and sell it for 500, 600, whatever. Yeah. Even then, it's not going to cover anything sure. for you. It's a hobby at best. Yeah. But I knew there was something in there. So... I spoke to my parents, told them this is not working. The corporate thing is not working mm -hmm. out. They could see it wasn't working out. Mm -hmm. And photography was going great, but my parents are firm believers in an education. My whole family is. And they said, well, if you want to pursue photography, 
get an education in it. So that sent me down like this path of finding where I would want to go and mm -hmm. study. I looked at a bunch of schools back home, but nobody was really teaching what I wanted to learn. And I didn't even know if it would have enough of, enough of an impact that would be valuable for me. So I started looking at schools abroad. I looked at Europe. I looked in the Asian market. I looked in Singapore. Then there was one, I think, in Thailand as well. So I looked at all of those options. I looked at options in the U.S., and I came upon the Academy of Art. And they were one of the few schools that was offering structured syllabus as to what you would be learning and when you would be learning that. So I said, well, that is the kind of structure I want. I don't mm. want to go in and be on a whim with someone being assigned to you as sure. your mentor and saying that, okay, this person is who you have to coordinate everything with. That, I couldn't wrap my head around it because... Our whole education system in India is you get into this grade, you know, these are the subjects, this is what okay. you'll be learning, this is the textbook to learn it from, and that is how you study. I was fine not having a textbook, <laughs> um, <laughs> but just the structure and seeing that in semester one, these are the four classes I'll be taking, and this is what those four classes teach you, going along right down to semester six, and this is everything you will be learning in your course. So I said, well, that makes sense for me. Then it was a toss up between an MA or an MFA. Mm. MFA allows me to teach, an MA does not. And ah. an MFA allows me to learn more about what I want to take up as a career. So I figured, well, an MFA makes more sense because mm. we've had teachers in our family. My dad's a teacher. He teaches maths and that made sense for me, you sure. know, that, well, someday I may want to teach. So. And other guests have explained to and Myself, I, I went to art school to be an art, art teacher at one point. You do have the opportunity then to see other human beings who are doing art <laughs> and explain why you're doing it. And actually, <laughs> hey, look, we're, we're discussing it. We have an instant kinship. It's kind of a nice way to force that camaraderie almost. <clears throat> yeah. And still and pay your rent and, and health insurance and things like True. that. No. For me, the MFA made the most amount of sense. 2018... September, I come here. I've started my MFA course. Uh, I'm still photographing action figures. And I was photographing action figures until a good year into the course. So oh, wow. until fall 2019, I was, action figures were my main uh, focus, mm -hmm. except for one class, which was the lighting class, okay. where we had to photograph people. My, my professor said, well, no. No action figures. At some point, someone uh, pulls you aside and goes, we need to see some human beings in your yeah. portfolio now, please. <laughs> I was terrified, but I found a workaround to it. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah. Explain. You have to explain that one. I found cosplayers. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yep. That makes sense. That makes sense. Hey, I need a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle done. <laughs> Bring in three so, Donatellos for me. I had Obi-Wan Kenobi. I had Princess Leia. I had Captain Rex. And Spider Man in my studio. Oh wow! And Ray, I had five cosplayers come in. They were affiliated to the Five of First in the Bay Area. Okay. So I reached out to them. I said, "Well, this is my first time going to be photographing people. Any chance you want to come on board mm -hmm. and see? Because I've got a cool concept in mind. I'll photograph you, and then I'll photograph action figures in the same way. We'll oh, very cool. Kind of little juxtaposition we'll there. Have them." together. Okay. So they were like, yeah, that sounds pretty cool. And that was when the proverbial bug bit me when it came to photographing people. And I said, well, this looks cool. The lighting looks cool. I like this. <laughs> <laughs> but then I was like, no, but I'm good at action figures. Let me stick to action figures. Mm -hmm. I've always been that way. Yeah. Once I get comfortable, it's very difficult for me to sort of break out of that comfort okay. zone. I like routine. I like rhythm. I like knowing that, okay, this is what I'll be doing. I've always been that kind of person, which goes completely and, and, opposite and to my career. Their, people have opinions, and I don't want that. <laughs> yeah, and it goes completely opposite to my career because sure. I'm a freelancer now, and right. there is no structure. <laughs> <laughs> I, and I have to imagine the theater background must have just kicked in hard. Yeah, it kicked in. It was like an instant connection. Okay, I need a shaft of light coming mm. in and highlighting Leia. She's trying to find her way out of this corridor. How do I show that? I don't have a corridor. I don't have the budget to build anything. Uh -huh. 
dark room shaft of light layer with glasses. Perfect. <laughs> so that's how we did it. I wanted to show an intense Obi-Wan Kenobi scene. I had that cosplayer look straight into the camera, but a little above mm -hmm. to have that cinematic look where you're not looking ever at yeah. the camera directly. Right. Lit him in a way I would light an action figure. Very cool Obi-Wan action figure. <laughs> so I was like, well, that's how I'm going to light this person. And I did it and it looked amazing. And I said, well, if I can do it with cosplayers, maybe someday I can think about it. Hmm. But then I put that aside. Really? Yeah. I was like, action figures it is. I went home. There was a new set of action figures waiting for me. And I was like, hello, my beauties. Come on. You don't argue. You don't, was, you don't, was, right. you don't <laughs> pose anywhere you suddenly want to pose. You don't switch. Your you emotions. don't switch up on me. I can. You don't get hungry. You don't yeah. need to go potty. <laughs> I can pose you however I want. So that allure was there. Okay. And it was, it was really cool. But in 2019, in the fall semester, I had one professor tell me in... The spring show of 2019, I'd shown my portfolio to a few people. They said, this is amazing work, but if you ask us, you're, you've either peaked or you're going to peak soon and you're going to be tired of this. Ah. So I said, no, that's not going to happen. Interesting. <laughs> There's no way I'm going to get tired of photographing action figures. They were like, no, it's not going to be right now. We're not going to say you're going to get out of this area and you're going to be done with it. It's going to creep up on you. But one day you'll wake up and you'll be like, okay, I'm done. Hmm. I don't know. Sure. And and they're absolutely, and that's correct advice. And rightly yeah. so that happened. Yeah. Um, How long? Fall 2019. <laughs> <laughs> I had a class where we were doing location lighting. And I was kind of compelled to photograph people over there because I, I only took that class because I wanted to learn how to light on location. How mm -hmm. do I combine ambient with strobe? How do I efficiently do it every single time? How do I get repeatable results? Mm. And the professor was someone I really admired and I thought he was super cool and he is, John Vano. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, he is awesome. I want to take his class. Uh, it doesn't matter what he's teaching. Okay. I took the class and he was like, well, you're going to have to photograph people for this class. So I said, okay, I can try that. We photographed people and it was so much fun. And eventually like the action figure stuff started to whittle down. Mm -hmm. I did two projects back to back, which encompassed everything I wanted to do in terms of storytelling. I have these action figures of Star Wars characters in Samurai. Uh, oh, God. wow. They're made by this Japanese company called Tamashi Nations, which recreates Star Wars characters as a samurai, a samurai oh, very era. Cool. Wow. Medieval Japan yeah. uh, characters. So you have a Ronin Boba Fett. You have a Shogun oh, Darth wow. Vader. Very cool stuff. And I did a whole project with that. And I did another project with these anthropomorph. Anthrop I'm going to say anthropomorphic and call yeah. that correct. Yeah. A bunch of action figures which have that whole element going on. And I combined that with, you know how in Star Wars you have the stormtroopers invading planet after planet yeah. and you had the empire setting up bases everywhere. So I had those two come together and did like this expansive project that I printed out on 13 by 19 oh, wow. of paper and it looked amazing. And I did that. And after that, I said, well, this is, this is it. <laughs> yeah. I, I said, okay, I'm done. Oh crap. They were right. <laughs> yeah. No, I saw that project. I said, this is amazing. I, tried creating something else which would sort of feel similar, but nothing felt quite right. Mm. And wow. I started photographing people and that felt really right. Uh, okay. And I said, well, evolution mm -hmm. or just boredom. I still gave it some time because I didn't want to just drop it like a hot potato. Yeah. I said, well, let me, let me wait and see what happens. I went back and forth. The action figure stuff started falling to the wayside, not because I was just done, but because I felt like, well, I have told the stories I wanted to tell. Mm. There are more stories, but at present, I want to photograph people. Mm. And that came very organically. It wasn't something that was forced on me. It wasn't something that I had a chance of pushing back against because I know that I, 
as a person, if someone tells me you have to do this, I'm going to be like, no, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> I'll know I have to do this, but sure. I'm going to still not do it yeah. just because. Just despite you. How no, dare you? No, not despite you. It's no? like, it's not my decision. Okay. I need to come to that decision. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so that's, that's how I was wired at one point in time that, okay, yeah. I'm, I'm not going to do it because you're saying I have to do it. Uh-huh. I'm going to do it when it comes naturally to me. But was there a fear? Because I know for a lot yeah, in, in photography. There was a fear. Okay. There was a huge fear. Okay. Because in photography, it's I'm either. I'm really good at this. Ah, okay. Why am I giving up what I'm really good at to jump into something I am terrified of? Were you terrified of photographing dealing people? with people? Yeah. Dealing uh, with people no, or photographing, photographing people? Photographing people. Okay. Um, What's the difference? You can deal with people. I did HR. I was. I wouldn't say I was ever bad at my job, Mm -hmm. but I could do what I was doing. And it was just photographing other people. Mm -hmm. And it would be easy to deal with the people. It would be easy to deal with the logistics of it all. Mm -hmm. The lighting was fine. I could do that. But the fact that I had to direct someone else, the fact that I had to accommodate for them not showing up, Mm -hmm. I had to accommodate for a last minute change of anything like the makeup's not working. The styling's not working. The person's come in a bad frame of mind. Any of those things cannot work. What do I do then? I don't have an image on hand. I need to have an image to turn in. I need to complete an assignment. There's four other people who've given me their time. What if I don't get something that's worth it? Whereas with action figures, it was, I can go anywhere with a box full of them. Mm -hmm. I have my lights in my backpack. Mm -hmm. I set up where I want. I get the image. I know I've got the image. I go back home, I edit it. It looks amazing. Yeah. And now you're doing amazing work with people, which sounds so silly to say. It's, it's like you've graduated to people now. Congratulations. It, it still terrifies me. Really? Yeah. It still terrifies me. I'm still nervous before every shoot. I still think, oh my God, what if the guy doesn't show up? Or what if the girl doesn't show up? What if my makeup artist calls in the morning and says, I've had a flat tire. I can't make it on time. Mm-hmm. I'll be like an hour and a half late. Uh-huh. What if, what if, what if, what if, what if? So many what ifs. Uh, How do you deal with that? Because I know for a lot of people who are interested in photography, there's definitely those people that's like, I just want to photograph people and I have no problem photographing people. So all my friends. Yeah. How are you dealing with that? Dare I say anxiety to make it uh, sounds, you know, Uh, psychiatric, which is not what I'm going for. But yeah, yeah. I just hope things will work out. Okay. Yeah. I, I believe that if people are committing their time, they're as serious about what they're committing to as what you're committing to. That goes both ways in terms of collaborative shoots mm-hmm. where it's just an exchange of services amongst everyone or it's a paid thing. If there's a paid thing, you know there's money on the table and that person's going to show up anyway because they're getting paid. Mm-hmm. And if it's a collaborative shoot, you know that they're only agreeing because they believe in what you want to create with them. because they have the same objectives in mind and it's like-minded people coming together. So there's no genuine incentive for them to screw you over. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm believing in. Okay. And that's how I'm approaching every shoot that if people are coming together to do something, they're coming together because they see an advantage in it for themselves as well. Mm -hmm. Because I mean, it's, it's human nature, right? You're not going to do something that you don't see is going to benefit you. So if someone's committing their time, they're seeing some sort of benefit in committing that time. So I'm hoping that works. And I hold myself to my own standard. So I know that it's going to be good work. Mm -hmm. And I know that it's going to be work that the people who are giving me their time are going to like, and they're going to say, okay, this is cool stuff that we committed our time to. And I ensure that if I have liked working with someone I will bring those people on board when there's money on the table as well. Mm. Because if you're giving me your time, your trust, and your skills, I want to make sure that when I can reward you for it monetarily, I will do that. Mm. Because it doesn't make sense to test with 100 people and then never have them show up on your set when there's actually money on the table, when there is commercial work. That is why you test, right? You want to find people you work well with as a team. And that's another thing with me, whether it's a restaurant, whether it's a brand of clothes, whether it's people, 
I'm very loyal to something that has worked out well for me. Okay. So if I like the food at a place, I'm going to keep going there. I'm going to keep ordering the same thing. <laughs> I'm not going to experiment. <laughs> Why do I need to experiment when I enjoy what I'm getting? Yeah. Same thing goes for working with people. If I know you're good, if I know you're giving me your best, why am I going to go looking elsewhere if I know that I can rely on you, if I know that you are someone that I can lean on, fall back on as a primary service provider for what service I'm looking for? So that's just how I approach team building and how I approach working with people in general. That sounds like the world's greatest HR manual ever. And I'm not being snarky. I mean, really, it's like you, you've you taken all those ideals we want in life and God, that's, I'm going to run my business. Uh, let's talk about that because you, you know, have very quickly and rightfully so are working now with real brands and creating yeah. real work. What was that process like to go, okay, I'm going to start running studios. I'm going to start hiring models. I'm going to start bringing in the crew and producing yeah. photo shoots. I actually don't know how that happened. <laughs> I have, okay. <laughs> I, have, I actually don't know. I, I'd say the earliest example would be in John Vano's class because he said, well, I want productions on our shoots. So you need to have images. I'm your client and you need to give me images that I will approve. Okay. And I had huge concepts in my head. Sure. So... Not surprising. I cannot count how many times I was told by professors, no, <laughs> this is too big. So for one of my classes, we had this class called ADC, Advanced Digital Capture, which was where we were trained how to use phase one and medium format. Mm -hmm. And we got hands on with all of that gear. For the final of that class, <laughs> I wanted to have, and this is an idea that's still in my head. I still want to do it. I wanted to create a visual of the last tree inside a vault and a cat burglar coming down from the ceiling to steal that tree. You guys that photoshopped, was, not that hard. No, <laughs> but that's the thing. With action figures, everything I did was in camera. Sure. So oh, right. I built my own oh, sets. Oh, wow. I right. Built yeah, sure. My, I built my own. I had my own effects. Yeah. So if there's snow, I found a winning formula for how to create snow that looked real mm -hmm. i would combine 10 different literally it's not a it's not an exaggeration yeah. 10 different qualities of white powdery substances in a particular ratio okay. to create snow mm -hmm. because snow is not going to be just one size right yeah. you're going to need sure. various sizes of particles yeah and if i could do that at the macro level i'm going to do that right but at the, when, at the end of the day it's still a, it's just a the Tupperware of snow that exactly. I can throw in my, you can throw in your backpack exactly. and just take with you. But I wanted to do the same thing with people. People. <laughs> if I'm going to show a car chase, I need to be in the back of that car with real motion blur going on mm. with an actual driver in the seat gunning the car down an open <laughs> stretch of road. I don't want to do that in Photoshop. It's easy to do that in Photoshop. Anybody can do that in Photoshop if they train themselves yeah. for like a week or two weeks sure. or whatever yeah. and make it look yeah. realistic. But to get it in camera, to get BTS off that being done and to show clients that I can handle your projects at whatever scale they are. I knew that if I'm getting into photographing people, it's going to be at the grandest, the biggest scale possible. <laughs> My smallest production had five people on it. That was a small, wow. lean team. <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> That was like, it's been the tiniest production I've ever run. I mean, there were others where it was just a beauty shoot, which would be like the model makeup artist and me. Uh -huh. But I'm talking actual production shoots. Mm -hmm. Five people was the smallest production I've oh, run. Wow. And the biggest one, I think, was about the last one I did. Well, that was 16 families and my whole team. So that was over 70 people over oh, three days. Gosh. So <laughs> I love productions. Okay. I love films. I love cinema. And I want that same aspect in my work. Mm -hmm. And whether someone agrees or not, you need people to make that happen. Absolutely. You cannot do it with three people in a room and say, okay, I'm going to make larger than life stuff. David LaChapelle is a huge inspiration for me. 
And I've seen his productions and I was like, I want. <laughs> when I saw that, I was like, I want all of that. Right, yeah. He's um, built, they're building a set for three days. Exactly. And I've built sets to varying degrees for mm-hmm. a lot of my projects, even when I'm photographing people. So that sense of production value is something that I've always wanted to pursue. And for the image series where I'd need to have the person coming down from the ceiling, I proposed to my professor. With I was very serious about it. He thought I'd lost my mind because I said, well, we'd bring in a crane. We'd have someone on a harness coming down from it. We'd have a crane supervisor. This is the company in LA that brings stuff up to San Francisco and they do it as well. I'll be pitching the project to them. And if they have like a crane or an operator free on any given point in time, we can have them come in. The only thing we need is a write-off from the building too. Bring that stuff in. And he just looks at me and he was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> Why, He's like, uh, just no? Just, just, no, it the happen? liability. Ah, Yeah. Small things. That was one thing I didn't know at the time. Okay. He True. said, you need to have your own insurance. There needs to be liability. Everything needs to be insured. There was a lot of legal stuff that comes into play when you're dangling someone from a crate. <laughs> I um, guess. Okay, yeah. sure. <laughs> so Stomping all of on that my was dreams, there. teacher. And it was a group project. Okay. And everyone else was like, no, that's too big. It's a class project. I was like, when has that ever stopped me? <laughs> 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 but we settled for something else, not as grand in scale. Um, I'm sorry. But no, it had, it had huge impact. <laughs> the final project that we did pushed for banning vape flavors to children under the age of 16. Okay. So it pushed for legislation within California. It got passed. And that's why flavored vapes are not sold to kids anymore because of that team project that we did. Oh my gosh. Um, So there was, you know, outcome to this. It was, there's outcome to it. Yeah. Okay. And even we had a professional photographer as our mentor, Benjamin Von Wong. Okay. He does all of these very... Yeah. Anybody uh, who's know anything high yeah. concept knows Ben Von Wong. Yeah. yeah. So he sort of advised me that when you're approaching productions like this, they need to have meaning behind them. Mm. Don't create spectacle for the sake of creating spectacle. Let there be some sort of meaning behind it. Let there be some sort of value that you're adding as opposed to just creating a cool looking photo. Mm-hmm. So... At that point in time, I was still pursuing cool looking photos. Sure. I still do, but now I try to have some sort of reason for why they need to look cool. Okay. And all of these little advices that I've gotten over three years, the kind of people I've been exposed to, the kind of professors that we've had, all of these people have put together all their knowledge. And if you're willing to take it, you really emerge ready for the professional world out of AAU. That's a huge advantage that I saw and, and something I'll always be grateful for. Well, that's tremendous. And the work you're doing now, you know, we're going to do a, a whole separate piece where we talk about some of the mm-hmm. work and we actually look at it uh, and put that up on YouTube so we can see it. But when you're pitching these concepts, you know, how's that discussion go when you're working with either a creative director or a brand that you're after? So an artist statement, mm-hmm. a mood board. And some previous work that relates to what you're pitching. That's how I approach my pitches. So recently, the 70 People Project that I Mm -hmm. told you about, that was shot within the Zoroastrian community in Mm -hmm. the Bay Area. And I got a grant of a little over $10,000 to accomplish that project. Okay. And that was raised by people in the community. It wasn't raised by an organization or anything. Okay. The reason being that They saw my Indian Renaissance project Mm -hmm. and they said, well, that looks cool. So you can clearly deliver on what you're pitching. Mm -hmm. And I pitch projects that mean something to me. So I guess I'm convincing when I talk about it and (laughs) the people feel like, yeah, he's not pitching this just for the heck of it. Uh He actually is invested in this idea. He actually wants to do this. Mm. And that sort of works out for me. I'm excited to see that because, I mean, I know enough about that that there are very few Zoroastrians worldwide, mm-hmm. let alone 70, didn't realize there were 70 families in the Bay Area. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that makes total sense that you're photographing somewhat of a a lost group of people or just we're a, a very, very small group. Very, very yeah. niche. And you're, very... you're, you're a Zoroastrian? Yeah, I am. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. 
that makes sense. But yeah. still, I mean, you know, when you learn about that, it's what's like, you know, people are like, yeah, one, one percent of yeah, we're, if that. We're maybe hundred to 200,000 across the world. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Okay. That's. Wow. That's all. So, you know, okay. not to be flippant, it's you, Freddie Mercury, and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, wow. Okay. That's a whole other podcast we're going to have to talk about. <laughs> I'm going to have to start a religious podcast just to talk about, because that's a fascinating thing for me. Long before I went to became an artist, I was a philosophy major. Yeah. So I didn't want to make money. I had a professor who was really, you know, instrumental in, in explaining that to yeah. us. We were like, What? You can live under the bridge. Who needs money? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's just me, you know, my tomes. Yeah. I mean, me up at Uhura Mazda going, come on, help me out. If you've got a rowboat, the Bay Bridge is pretty long. <laughs> <laughs> you know, exactly. <laughs> All right. Shazad, we are going to, you know, have some fun when we talk about it on YouTube. But this has been a pleasure, man. I want to bring you back for more. But this has been really, really good. Awesome. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. So there you have it, some great advice and a great story. And I hope you took some notes because if you've ever dreamed about a career in art and design, more and more art and design career opportunities are on the rise and employers are on the hunt for the next generation of talented and of course skilled creative professionals. Here at Academy of Art University, you will get those work ready skills that employers want. You can study on site in downtown San Francisco and of course anywhere in the world with our online programs. To request info about our 40 plus areas of study in art and design, including game development, industrial design, illustration and fine art, just visit our website at academyart.edu slash creative mind. My name is Bobby Brill. Thanks for listening.